All right, so we're going to get started. So welcome, everybody. I'm Ritesh Patel. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this session. And as you can see, this is going to be a fun one. This is the last one for the day, hopefully, and then we can all go and enjoy, right? So uh, we are going to talk about uh, you know, creating paved path for paths for platform engineers. And what does that mean, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about platform engineering. And uh, you know, platform engineering teams are creating paved, paved paths for developers, golden paths for developers, so that development teams can, you know, build, innovate, you know, faster at scale. Here we are about. We are what we are going to talk about is focus focus on how platform engineering teams can build platforms. What kind of you know uh, uh, reference architectures? What kind of uh, implementations that we've seen? Su uh, succeed, and we have uh, the entire panel over here who's going to share their experiences and thoughts with us. So let's get started. Um, again, we'll start with some introductions and then jump into the conversation. So huh. go ahead, Prasida. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Prasida Satie, and I'm principal container specialist, and I work with the uh, uh, Kubernetes, OS, uh, open source, everything around it, uh, and at, for my AWS customers. Uh, so I'm very excited for this because I've been uh, working with one of the platform initiative called Canoe. So we'll talk more about it. I'm Victor. <laughs> and I'm not as cool, so I will explain that I am Abby. Uh, I work at Syntasso. We're building a framework, Cradix, for helping people build platforms. Uh, and I'm also a co-lead of the platforms working group. So come by the tag app delivery uh, pavilion booth if you want to come chat more about what we're doing in the CNCF. And I'm Nicholas Mori. I'm a solutions architect with Red Hat Canada. All right, so let's let's get started with the elephant in the room, right? I mean, CNCF landscape, you know, it's huge. It key, continues to grow. You know, it's exploding. If you're a platform engineer, how do you make sense of it, right? How do you get started with this landscape? What do you do? You know, what's you know what's there out there to guide you? And for that, I'm going to you know, let Victor start, since he's so impatient to get started. <laughs> Why did you start, given all the experience you have with all these tools that you've evaluated in the past? <laughs> I think it's madness, honestly. Uh, it's CNCF, nobody can start in CNCF landscape because there are 200-something projects, right? Uh, I feel that we are now getting to the point of consolidation, right? So it's not, not not many projects are entering anymore, and try, we're trying to figure out what are the, finally figuring out what are the common choices, right? A uh, good example of that would be Othel, right? Kind of, okay, we finally agree that open telemetry is a thing. Uh, we don't need to worry about that much anymore, and then we can move to the next subject, similar like uh, things are happening in CNIs and, and other areas, while some others are still in a, battle for survival mode. The only thing that is certain is that it's Kubernetes. That, that's all. Anybody else want to jump in? I really like the example of picking a good surface mesh. There's like five different options out there, and you could literally <laughs> spend months just picking the service mesh for your Kubernetes platform. And you got to wonder, like, how much value is that really driving for your organization, like making that decision yourself, reinventing the wheel, just to get connectivity between your applications, it, it's really hard. So I can share my experience. Uh, when we work with the, our customers at AWS, uh, we found that uh, the enterprise companies uh, like Autodesk, Adobe, and all, they are facing the similar cha challenges, how to navigate within the CNCF world, right? Like, and uh, the strategy what we took is like, we built a capability map, uh, like you have in your blog, saying that, uh, you know, like uh, infrastructure as a code, policy as a code, uh, developer platform, and GitOps, right? So we created those uh, capability map, and then we tried to map the CNCF uh, technologies to those. And we validated with all the enterprise companies what they use so that we have a guarantee and trust that we'll, we will be having contributors, we'll, have, we'll be having their best practices and everything what they are working right now. So that. Yeah, I think piecing those two last comments together, it's about finding the business value first and, and worrying about, or then investing in how much time it takes to uh, dive into which of the tech solutions. And that's where we're finding these um, 
initiatives like Canoe and, and things really helpful, and we're also seeing it coming out of working groups, similar to OTEL coming out of observability working group. We're seeing um, a lot of work being done by the app developer working group within Tag App Delivery to try and identify uh, the tools within the landscape that can be most supportive of app developers and, and things like that. So. Perfect. So that's a you know, great segue to talk about reference architecture, right? You mentioned Kano, you talk, talked about a capability map. Um, so do they work? I mean, are they something that, you know, a team can take and just, you know, go ahead with the implementation? Or do they be, have to be aware of, you know, certain issues or other things that they need to, you know, worry about, right? How does, what have you seen with your customers maybe Prasida since okay. you've been working on sure it. yeah I can uh, talk about canoe again uh, if, uh, if nobody is aware of canoe uh, you can go to canoe.io uh, it's basically a collaborative and open source uh, initiative project uh, which is which was started by AWS of course but uh, it is not uh, it is cloud agnostic and uh, we have our uh, rest of the folks enterprise companies collaborating over there so talking about the reference implementation over there. So Canoe actually has an IDP builder, uh, which you can use for your internal developer platform. Um, I know like if you want to build it on uh, staging or anything, you have to create so many GitHub repository and PRs and all those things. You don't want to do that, right? So this IDP builder actually provides you the local environment. Uh, you can also use uh, GitHub code spaces, but it provides an environment where you can bring up the kind cluster, and then you can bring uh, Git, uh, Git uh, T, which is uh, in cluster Git repository, uh, Git server. So it's very lightweight. It's inside the Kubernetes, and then it has Argo CD backstage. So everything comes up in your uh, local environment, and you can test it out. Uh, you can provide a reference implementation using Kaverno. Uh, you can provide backstage templates. So you can do a lot more, uh, and we already have examples over there uh, in our repository. Yeah, I mean, I might have a slightly different opinion. I think that those the, those combinations like Anu, which is absolutely great, are probably good as a, uh, hey, somebody made choices, maybe those choices are good for me so that I can keep spending months trying to figure out what to choose, right? But that's it, right? Because setting up a few tools is important, but that's kind of that just miserably small amount of work you need to do, right? Kind of thing. Uh, after you set up backstage, you need to create the plugins that do whatever they need to do. After you set up crossplane, you need to create compositions that do whatever they need to do. After you set up Argo CD, you still need to define all your manifests and what's not, right? So I think that those references are good starting point, but I, I don't think that anybody should have high hopes that, yeah, you install it and you're done. Kind of, no, you did not even start. Yeah, it's not even that, it's just even configuring those tools. So I've used IDP Builder and I think it's a fantastic tool to get hands on with projects quickly. So we saw that a lot of people in the room are getting started with platform engineering. First of all, welcome. Second of all, part of it is just getting experience with things and IDP Builder is a great way to get started with things. But it is not a production configuration setup and they are the first ones to tell you that. So this is not me trashing on the project. Uh, things like security and things like scalability and performance and those kinds of tunings that you're going to need to do at organizations of scale are not part of the reference architectures. But some very smart people and some really great organizations have put their heads together to say these tools can do those things. So if you need them, you can start with these tools and then move them forward as you need to to get to the scale and performance and everything else that you need in your org. And when you're looking at a reference architecture, it's important to ask, like, what questions is this reference architecture answering? Like, is this relative to your scale? Does it have your same security concerns? Is this reference architecture ready for an air-gapped environment? Is it, which compliance uh, regimes does it comply to? Compliance for compliance. Uh, I, I think it's also interesting to look at um, the, if you were at the panel session before this, the end user tab from the CNCF also publishes reference architectures that come out of specifically end user organizations. So they're not tied to any specific vendor. It's here's what we've done and here's our experience. And then you can understand if that relates to the challenges that you're having. 
And um, Abby, you touched on a great point, right? Um, this is just a beginning. This is just a start. But then, uh, for for a lot of um, you know platform teams, where do they draw the line, right? Where is it? Where do they, when do they think about build versus buy even, right? I mean, what what's your take since you work in this domain quite a bit? Yeah, I was actually just having this conversation with someone who's in the audience, and I spotted them, uh, where I said, you know, it's it's not build versus buy. It's it's more of a spectrum, because uh, even if you are building your own. Uh, stack, you are most likely building with existing components, so things like open source projects that do have opinions about what they offer you. That is buying their opinions if you're building with their projects. Um, and if you're buying, you also are not going to stop there. You probably have certain configurations that you're doing both that they offer you within the tool, and also I uh, I, for one, know I have done many a workaround around the tool that I've purchased to really make it fit into my organization's requirements. And so uh, I think it's always a spectrum uh, is the first kind of conversation to have. Where to draw the line? My belief is that a um, platform is what is unique to the business but common to the teams within the business. So what you should be buying are the things that are not unique to your business, the things that are common to the industry or to the, the entire world, compute, uh, data storage, those might be very common for you. They might not. If you're high speed, high frequency trading, that's an argument for very specialized networking. But think about the things that are common, that are super unique to your business value, bring that into your platform. And the second piece being, the things that are common across enough teams within your organization to make it worth standardizing, centralizing, and optimizing. So when you have a single team doing something, enable them to do what they need to on their own. But when you have many teams, multiple or many teams, that's where you're pulling that in. So uh, and you should be, to be clear, building the platform part of that, because that's what's unique to your business, but also leveraged unique to your business. One way to look at it is that if you go to one extreme and say, I'm going to buy it, and use it as is, right? You're, that's something that is opinionated, that has certain flow, how it works, and so on and so forth. And you are getting ready to adapt to that thing. Right? It's not going to adapt to you. Right? And I'm talking about extreme buy, because it's never buy and not touch it. But yeah, Heroku, as an example, that's a buy. You just write code. You push there, it does whatever it is doing, and you live happily ever after. The problem is that if you go to that extreme, it's enough to have 1% of your needs not covered for that to break apart, right? And then you, you quickly realize that it's never buy only, just to be clear. It's not buy only. Yeah, and also it depends upon like uh, when you start building a platform team, right? You need to decide like uh, there's always a battle between standardization and flexibility, right? So you need to understand like what is important. Uh, is there any 80-20 use cases? Uh, do you need? Do you have the use cases? Uh, all the teams are working in one way. Uh, only like 20% probably are one-off cases. Probably based on all those decision points also leads to. Uh, build or buy. And this might be the wrong audience to say this, but it, 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 be careful on the amount of how much pride you have in building everything, because I, I love build, piecing together open source projects, and I get a lot of pride out of it, but it does not try business value, and your managers will be like, so you spent a week putting that together, or, or probably months putting it together when there's this enterprise-ready supported solution over here, and it is not unique to our business. So it's important to balance that. If you wanna go build platforms all day, maybe go work for a company that that's the product that they build is platforms, and then you can have that pride and that, that, uh, that experience. Awesome. So as, as you go about building your platform, there's several different aspects you need to be concerned about, right? Like there's obviously the infrastructure, um, there's security, there's the use developer experience, and some of these are at odds with each other, right? Like, how do you handle, like, you know, security while not it's impacting developer experience? The important thing is that what you, is that, so I'm going to say something outrageous. Develop, uh, platform teams cannot build a platform. 
it's impossible. You, if you consider yourself, if any of you consider yourself platform engineers and you think that you're going to build a platform, you're terribly, absolutely, completely wrong. You cannot do it. And the reason why you cannot do it is because you would need to demonstrate that you know everything about networking, everything about storage, everything about uh, applications, everything about Kubernetes, and so on and so forth. If you are that person, we're hiring. <laughs> I don't think that you exist, but just in case. Uh, so the way I see it is that if you are a platform engineer, you are creating a framework where people that have certain experience in certain areas can convert that experience into a service, right? So there is a Joe in a basement forgotten by everybody. He's the, he's the person who spent 20 years with databases. That's the person who needs to figure out how to provide databases as a service in your platform. The only thing you can do, and you should do, is to enable that person to convert his experience into a service that you're scaffolding, right? And that kind of indirectly answers your question, kind of, you're not building a platform. You're just gathering people from different, with different experiences that are creating the platform or services in that platform. I was gonna say, can we, can we right now agree to to make that the definition of a platform. <laughs> so like uh, you I say- I don't know if I could repeat what I just said, but okay. <laughs> That's gonna go straight into the glossary, right? Yeah. No, but like, one of the analogies I use all the time is I love using all sorts of platforms as a consumer. I use ride sharing platforms, I use shopping platforms like Etsy and things. And when mm -hmm. I think about the teams behind those platforms, they're not the ones who are driving the cars or asking for rides. They're not the ones who are making homemade goods or looking to, to shop for Christmas, right? They are the ones building the ability for producers and consumers to uh, interact with each other in an effective way. That's what you're, like I hear yeah, that's exactly. what you're describing. That is a platform. Yeah. But we have somehow transformed in the technology world platform into a technology decision that is sort of closer to what we see as an operations of history. Right, and uh, so I think we can make, at least you and I, I don't, yeah. I don't know about you two, I hope so, can, can make an agreement, like that is what platform is, I yeah, agree. It's a, you're making choices of, hey, I'm going to build a platform, it's going to have this front end, it's going to have this back end, it's going to have this, that, what, kind of, those are the technology choices of the platform. Now, everybody else, come in and, and plug something into that thing, that, that's all there is to it. I'm simplifying, right? So <clears throat> going back to your question, probably you were asking about security, right? So I was thinking that uh, when you build a platform, it's exactly similar how you build an application, right? In DevOps, like you have to take care like security as uh, in the consideration when you start building something. So exactly for the platform engineering, I feel that is very important, shift left. And plus you can, uh, of course, have some defaults for the issues what uh, Victor and Abby were saying, some security defaults, like when you uh, spin a namespace, you need to have certain certain restrictions over that with respect to quota or anything, right? Policy as a code is important, uh, implementing Kverno or any uh, OPA or anything else. So I think security uh, is very important with respect to platform engineering. And uh, touching on security, a common approach is obviously implementing policies. If we're, we'll stick with Kubernetes for a moment. You have something like Kyverno in your cluster. It has policies, and it's to catch things that go outside of the same defaults or are known bad things, like using the latest image in production. Just things that like you're like, duh, obviously we shouldn't have that. Um, but it's important to use those policies as like, uh, if you get a hit on that policy and you block an action, you know, as the platform engineer, you're like, got him. I know he, he did the wrong thing, I got him. But really what that is, is it's a signal saying like, okay, maybe there's an education problem. Maybe I need to add in a little just-in-time education to say like, hey, I noticed you're using the latest image. Here's why you shouldn't, and here's how to remediate that. And then the other aspect of this is developer experience, right? So ultimately, who, who, who is the consumer of your platform? Right? I mean, it's actually, like you said, it's a two-sided 
<coughs> market, but then you have the producers, the, the, the infrastructure team and others who are providing some of these services, but then it's consumed by development team. So a lot of your, you know, I guess your user experience and all of that has to be kind of geared towards developers, right? And so how do you balance that out and what are some of the key considerations there? This is where I get to be the bad guy. Am I allowed that mantle for a second? I'll there? reverse, I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, so I, I truly believe that while developer experience is a huge part of success for an organization, because developers are an expensive portion of the, the budget line, they are a key part of success of delivering applications and success of the business, uh, I think we have swung in a way that makes it almost like uh, employee happiness in sort of the early 2000s where if there's a beer fridge and a pool table, everyone is considered to be an, a happy employee. When what we realized, you know, with the decade past is that uh, you want actually autonomy and freedom to do your job and you want the ability to, to go home to your family and not have to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and do your laundry at the office because you have to be there for so many hours, right? And I think when we talk about platforms and we talk about developer experience in the kind of beer fridge, pool table way, we make it seem like it needs to be uh, the type of shopping experience we get online shopping where everything's easy, one click, and, and, and beautifully designed in great colors. When what I think people want, especially when talking about security as we were, is they want to not have to think about it. They want to get feedback when they do something that is going to get them into trouble because they don't want to be in trouble. Uh, and that's really what I think if we prioritize that, people's experience people's developer experience will improve, uh, more so than if we prioritize sort of the look and feel uh, in that way. Uh, we, we make that mistake over and over trying to figure out what people want. And nobody's asking people what they want. <laughs> kind of, because you know, you, I'm a platform engineer, I think other people need this, I think that they want this. And I'm a vendor and I also think that, and I, I've been speaking with quite a few teams in different companies doing some kind of platform engineering, and when I ask, who is your product manager, I almost never get a name. Almost never get a name, right? So, we're not treating it as a product, we're not treating them as customers, we know what they want, and it's guaranteed to be successful because at the end of the project, we're gonna go to CTO, CTO is going to say everybody has to use this, there is no option, no alternative, and, we, and then we come to KubeCon to some of the talks and say, success rate of our company, 5,000 people adopted our platform at the, the barrel of a gun. <laughs> or uh, they, 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 they could choose between adopting a platform or uh, getting a resignation letter. Choose left or right. Almost ne uh, very few companies, very few teams that are building some kind of platform are approaching it in the same way as being, imagine being a startup that does not yet know what is the product that we are, final version of the product that we are going to make. We do not know what is the market fit. We do not know yet who are our customers. We just have an idea. That's how startups work, most of the startups. And then you spend infinite amount of time trying to reach that one person that says, no, this is actually good. And a couple of more years until you reach, I don't know, some critical number or something like that, right? And most of that work falls on, on product, uh, product manager rather than engineering. It's easy to build stuff. The, 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 what, what most people kind of, we all get tied kind of like, oh, technology, this or that. It's not that hard. You sit down, you learn Kubernetes. I mean, it takes a bit of time, but you do it, right? You learn Argo CDN. We know that we should use Argo CDN. We should use Caverno. We should use Crossplane. That's easy. Yeah, I have like a slight a different opinion. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How dare you? I'm trying to dare. <laughs> okay. Right. I mean, we're looking at you straight in your face. Okay. <laughs> so. so I feel that like, uh, Platform engineering uh, should be like treated as a product. So, Plus so far one. we agree. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm still waiting for the. So moment. Uh, we need to have uh, like different teams have different requirements, right? So first thing is you don't go there and boil the ocean, build something, right? You need to first have a survey, all the customer ask, like gather all the ask, and build the roadmap for that. So you have to literally treat 
it as a product, right? Then you, once you treat it as a product, you put the roadmap, then you need to make sure you build the stack, you test the stack exactly the way you do the actual application development, version control, documentation, office hours. These are very important, and I, uh, trust me, I did this in my previous company at eBay, like where we built such a platform, and it kind of 90% work because there are 10% use cases where we cannot satisfy them. Uh, those are like escape hatch, you can say, and then you need to build something different for them, uh, maybe give direct access to manual uh, creation of the uh, resources. So those are, those are the cases. But I say that treating it as a product, it really works. If you did you agree, agree on that? You're so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what is the I part you don't agree? <laughs> okay. Then you agreed with everything I said. <laughs> then we are same. We are huh? same. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. There, are, there are cases Correct. that yeah. successful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. One last comment on that is that uh, you would not believe how many organizations are interested in building an internal developer platform and they haven't even automated the entire workflow yet. So like, how are you going to automate the click ops in a self-service portal? Like, it, 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 They're incompatible. People are jumping the gun to go and do, do the building of the platform before focusing on the full value stream from going from writing code to getting it into production. I think we're almost um, out of time. We have five more minutes, and would like to see if anybody in the audience has any questions for the panel. I think we have some mics back there, so we start taking some questions. First one there gets it. Go, go. <laughs> all right, so, um, so I've heard you all say, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, like value propositions are important, right? You have to provide value. You have to reduce the mental switch statement of people who are using your products. And you have to kind of avoid the ivory tower problem that platform teams fall into, where they think they know what's best without having connection to the people actually using their tooling. But the question I have is, what are some actual mechanisms you all have found to ensure those things are happening? Sounds like a culture challenge, honestly. <laughs> like, are, are you building a platform without doing the, the office hours, without treating it like a real product? Like, are you building a platform because some VP read it on, on LinkedIn last week, and now they're like, this is our new initiative? Um, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I would say, like, uh, culture shift is a big thing, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, to make sure that whatever you build, uh, folks have to adopt that, right? So uh, evangelism, I would say, like Victor does. So that's the best way like, to say that uh, how you have proved uh, some of the POCs you can showcase, uh, some of the common use cases you can pick up from uh, multiple teams, and that's the way you can go for it. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to comment on a tiny fraction of what you said, culture shift. I think that everybody is too obsessed with cultural shift. We need to change the culture. We need to, without changing culture, we cannot do this. And I believe that that's only partly true because the tools change the culture. Yeah. Using tools, you're changing the, the culture. I'm not saying that you should never change the culture, but I don't see other effective ways to change the culture. What am I going to go from office to office and say, change? Right? The internet changed the culture. Cars change the culture. AI is changing the culture. Tools are changing the culture. If you create tools are a reflection of certain culture, right? Certain culture creates certain tools. But also those tools that adopted by others force change of a culture. Assuming they get adopted was, was a very good point. Yeah. Uh, I want to get to more questions. I would just say uh, take a platform engineer to work day. Hmm. Go, go literally sit with people for hours of their day and see what they do. Like, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And it's for something really, you're asking for really concrete. And I think, just go sit with people. Left, right, or kind of awesome. Uh, fantastic panel. Um, so I think, like, Victor did something. He, he hit the nail on the head that the choice is, like, you can adopt the platform or find a new job. Like, it's something my platform team, we had conversations together, like, with that statement exactly. And, like, this is not a, this is not a bad faith question, but... Like where we wind up is if like customers have choice and like our customers don't, 
So is like a customer centric approach like really like what we should be doing? Like because you're right, like it's not really a choice to be like you can use the thing like you can use the things we build or you can find a new gig. It seems like it's more of like a Game of Thrones approach of let's curry favor with the right technology leaders and just like call this what it is and move forward with like if they don't have a choice, are they your customers? I mean, They're exactly. They're your users, but your customers might be your business in that case. And like, we have to be aware that your users do deserve attention and, and to be treated like customers and people who, who matter. But if they don't get given a choice, you might be servicing uh, your business and not your engineers. And you should be aware of that if that's the case. And how do you know even that you did the right thing? Right? Th that you built something that is useful. Because we don't know that, right? Everybody's forced to. This is the only way you can do it. Well, so there yeah. must be a choice. And that's for the benefit of the end users and you as a builder, as, just as much. And awesome. It, one of the things that I think that companies make a mistake that they very often mandate, like, you need to use this. Instead of mandating, you need to accomplish certain things, right? Your image needs to be signed. Is to verify the identity of that image is the correct approach. Saying you need to use SIGSTORE to sign your image is a silly thing to do, right? Because you're completely eliminating any innovation, right? You're preventing people from finding better ways to do, to accomplish certain objective. Thank you. Freedom. <laughs> He'll keep going. You should ask the next we have one. Last, last question. I think we have just one minute, but then we'll be around for okay, more questions. Well, hopefully this will be pretty quick. I, actually, it's funny because I, I, I agree with you again, Victor, as, as I guess most, so, so many of us do. Um, but, but one of the things you said earlier, um, I, I forget, was it maybe in response to the second question about uh, you know, who, who a platform engineer is um, <clears throat> and that there really is no like, single platform engineer. Um, one of the things that I've been noodling on, and, and I think we've even had conversations about in the past, is like how do you scale out that that staff that's platform engineering? Like how do you um, go from a place where you're you know have a small team that's dedicated trying to hit you know a small set of use cases to the ones that are actually you know meeting the guy who's in the basement who's the database you know guru, um, and you know I'm going to use an unholy word here, uh, but like but like how do you how do you build inner sourcing into your platform as a first class citizen, right? I mean, I know that we've, we've there's different patterns out there, right? Um, and, and, I, and I'm a big fan of the Kubernetes API and using the Kubernetes API as an integration layer, um, but that's not necessarily easy, right? So Kubernetes is a good example, right? It's designed, oh no, go for it. No. <laughs> go for it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to now. <laughs> I mean, yes, you need to create, your job as a platform engineer is precisely to do that, to create a mechanism how something can be extended, how something can be plugged into, right? And enable people to, um, to plug their, their experience. And how do you scale it? You scale it by actually everybody in a company is a potential contributor to the platform just as much as a user, right? I'm very good at databases. I can create databases as a service, and I have no idea how to do CI, CD, so I'm becoming a consumer at the same time, right? And you scale it by simply having and think of it in your source, open source, something like that, that is well documented, easy to extend, uh, and everybody just does it. I, I, only, I only want to riff on that really quickly because I, I think that I agree with that. The point, I guess, is like, have you guys seen patterns and practices that actually make that easy, right? Like, because asking everyone to learn how to use KubeBuilder is not something that scales very quickly. Yeah, I, I, I liked Victor's earlier comment on treating it like a startup, and, and the startup methodology is that you start early with somebody that is eager to try something new, that they have a real problem that you can solve, and, and you, you target them first. And then they become this, like, this story that you can share to other teams to inspire them to be curious enough to want to learn these new tools rather than 
kind of forcing it down their throats. It's about driving adoption naturally by people uh, seeing it as the better option, seeing it as the solution to their problem rather than something that they just have to buy into and then they're naturally going to resist or try to find ways around it. And yeah, and I think this is where I was saying that the, and, and Victor said as well, like the platform's job is to not just service people who need things from the platform, but also people building on it. So if what you're saying is that the people in your organization are struggling to create things, whether, whatever way, whether it be controllers or whether it be any other way of plugging things into this platform, then what you're saying is you have an opportunity there to treat the platform like a product, figure out what way they do want to contribute, and what their technologies are that they are comfortable with and help them build it and help make sure that that's the way they can add on to your platform. Or you can use QBuilder. And just to add... Don't uh, use QBuilder. <laughs> and it has a scale. Can I add? Okay. And just to add that uh, if you want to scale, if you want to test the scalability of your platform, uh, definitely what I mentioned, the canoe is one of the reference implementation. You can go for it. Like you don't like one of the technology, it's okay. You can replace it with another one, try it out, scale it, and then evangelize with a certain one uh, team end to end. And that is the team which will be actually the one who will be in front of you and uh, educate the rest of the teams in your company. So, awesome. I think we are out of time, but we're going to stick around for any questions, any other conversations. So. Thanks, Thank thanks you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thanks for attending.